right, let's get started. My name is Rachel Brand. I'm the chairman of the Litigation Practice Group of the Federalist Society. The Litigation Practice Group is the organization that is responsible for planning the panel that you're about to hear. Thank you for being here. Uh, the reason I'm here is just to say 30 seconds about the practice group and encourage you to get involved if you are not already. You may or may not know that much of the programming of the Federal Society, including most of the panels at this conference, are organized by the practice groups. Uh, there's a litigation practice group, free speech, criminal law, administrative law, and, and the list goes on. So I'd encourage you, if you're a member of the Federalist Society and you're not currently involved in a practice group, to get involved. If you're not a member, I'd encourage you to join and then get involved. And you can come find me afterwards or any member of the Federalist Society staff and ask them how to get more involved in the practice groups. And so my job here is done, and I will pass it off to uh, Judge Griffith, who is a man who needs no introduction, being a very familiar face at our convention, uh, Judge Tom Griffith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for being here today. Uh, it's my job to introduce uh, our panelists on what plans to be uh, an interesting uh, and, and perhaps spirited discussion on a, uh, a, a topic that I must confess to you is new to me. So my role as a moderator, I will not be the type of moderator that trenches upon the uh, speakers. I'm here to, uh, to listen and to, to learn. Uh, but but uh, we've met beforehand and we've agreed that the, the format will be that uh, uh, Professor Malo will, will start us off uh, and then we'll go in order. I'll, I'll introduce this, the speakers before they speak. Each speaker will give, will, uh, give his uh, uh, remarks, and then there, we're going to allow some time for some interaction, reaction among and between the speakers, uh, and then following that, we'll leave uh, ample time for questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, but allow me to introduce our distinguished panel today. Uh, professor Jonathan Malo is a professor of law at Georgetown University. He teaches courses on litigation finance and litigation risk management. He's the author of numerous law review articles on litigation risk transfers and litigation finance. Mr. Malo is also a co-founder and chief investment officer of Burford Capital, the world's largest provider of investment capital and risk solutions for litigation. Uh, Mr. Malo graduated from Yale College and Harvard Law School. He clerked for Justice Breyer on the Supreme Court and practiced law at Cleary Gottlieb and at Kellogg Huber. Uh, Walter Olson is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He has written a series of widely acclaimed books on our legal system. On the web, he founded and continues to run Overlawyer.com, widely cited as the oldest blog on law, as well as one of the most popular. The Washington Post has described him as an intellectual guru of tort reform. His writing appears regularly in such publications as the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, and he has been a columnist for Great Britain's Times online as well as reason. He's advised public officials at all levels, appeared on hundreds of broadcast shows, including Oprah, and testified before Congress. Uh, Ashley Keller uh, co-founded uh, Gertrude Keller Capital and serves as a managing director responsible for underwriting, investment selection, and portfolio management. Prior to that, Mr. Keller was an analyst at Alieska Investment Group, a Chicago-based market-neutral hedge fund where he focused on investments in companies, in companies facing litigation and other complicated regulatory matters. Mr. Keller is a former partner at Bartlett Beck, uh, and Bartlett Beck, just Bartlett Beck, I won't give him away, Bartlett Beck, right. where he handled various <laughs> trial and, and appellate matters. A graduate of Harvard College and the Don't Law and Business Schools at the University of Chicago, Mr. Keller worked, clerked for Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit and Justice Anthony Kennedy of the Supreme Court. Our final speaker, uh, will be John Beisner. Beisner is a partner at Skadden Arps uh, and leads its uh, mass torts, insurance, and consumer litigation group. Over the past 25 years, he has defended major U.S. and international corporations in more than 600 purported class actions filed in federal courts and in 40 state courts at both the trial and appellate levels. He has also handled numerous matters before the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation, as well as proceedings before various federal and state administrative agencies. He's advised on numerous uh, uh, high visibility corporate crisis situations, including congressional hearings, federal agency investigations, state attorneys general inquiries, and GAO reviews. He is a frequent writer and lecturer on class action and complex litigation issues, and has been an active participant in litigation reform initiatives 
before Congress, state legislatures, and judicial committees. With that, we'll start with uh, Professor Malone. Thank you, Judge Griffith. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for organizing it, and the fellow panelists for what per perhaps will be a spirited discussion. We'll see. But um, I was charged to spend a couple more minutes than the other panelists by, by all of our agreements, so don't think I'm hogging the mic. Uh, just <laughs> so that we can get a sense of, because not everybody knows what we're talking about, what is litigation finance of the sort we're talking about. So, so in the course of my remarks, I'll spend a few minutes just laying out the history of it <coughs> and what it is we're talking about. Um, I want to start with a little bit of a personal history of my interest in litigation finance. So I've taught, I'm a law professor at Georgetown, and I've taught your basic courses in civil procedure, federal courts, administrative law, the sorts of courses that would relate to the other topics that are discussed at you know, the convention in these couple of days. But I've also taught corporate finance and insurance law, and the reason is my interest has always been, or has at least in recent years, been in how litigants manage the expense and risk of the litigation process. We all know the litigation process takes a long time and costs a lot of money, and risk management and expense management is a big part of it from a client's perspective. Um, everybody here knows that the vast majority of lawsuits don't make it to trial. Uh, they settle if they make it that far past a motion to dismiss. And we all know that the cases settle in part based on their merits. Um, they're supposed to settle based on the party's predictions of what would happen if the case went to trial. But we also know that other factors can influence settlements, um, in particular non-merits factors that will affect how much a litigant is willing to go the distance to trial and how much the litigant needs certainty and finality sooner and has to settle. That's going to affect settlement dynamics. There could be an imbalance in risk preferences or resources between the parties that's going to affect settlement. So sometimes that'll work to the disadvantage of a defendant. Take a company that's engaged in uh, a business deal, it's gonna raise capital through a private equity deal, a merger acquisition, um, a bond offering. And it happens to also be a defendant in a big lawsuit, maybe one of the class actions they've called John Beisner to defend them in. Um, it may be that the client needs certainty in order to pave the way for the business deal at a moment when the litigation process doesn't necessarily lend itself to providing that certainty, and the client may end up paying more for the suit to get rid of it than the merits would otherwise warrant, because you need certainty. Conversely, it can often work the other way around. You imagine a case where you've got a small company and a big company that entered into a joint venture. Um, they're both sophisticated commercial actors. When they did the business deal, they were both represented by AMLO 100 firms. Um, and when a dispute arises, the joint venture falls apart and they find themselves in litigation, the larger company can go hire its regular counsel as litigation counsel and run it the, the way you normally would. The smaller company may have already spent all the money it raised in private equity markets or wherever on the failed business deal. It would like to hire the same caliber lawyers it has hired in the past the AMLO 100 firm that it uses for its deal work for raising money for whatever it is. And it's a complex commercial dispute of the sort that that's the kind of law firm you'd want to handle the case. But at this point, facing millions of dollars um, of legal fees on an hourly fee basis over the next few years, uh, the small company may feel like we can't go the distance. The small company is the one that may need, uh, may need financing or it's going to find out, find itself uh, at a disadvantage going forward. So I began to write articles about how both defendants and plaintiffs would benefit from the availability of a market that would absorb litigation risk and expense from litigants so that the parties could resolve disputes based on the merits rather than these imbalances. And I actually began to see that in fact litigation finance is something that would be of value not just to the smaller players, but, but often the very big ones, whether they're defendants or plaintiffs. Think about the general counsel of a Fortune 100 company who's got a budget that's got to cover deal work, compliance, regulatory work, and the litigation budget may be constrained, and it would like to use its regular law firm, and it may have affirmative litigation against another company that the general counsel says, I've got to bring this suit. Like, the, there's money that's owed to the company, I owe it to my investors. 
resolve this, but asks his regular lawyer, would you do this on an alternative billing arrangement? Would you do it for a contingent fee? And the firm may say, you know what, we'll take some of it, but that's not our business. We don't do contingent fee work. And the company would like to be able to get the lawyer of its choice, the billing arrangement of its choice, and the law firm, frankly, wants to do the business. You can imagine the partner at the firm who really wants to do this case, thinks, in fact, you'll make more money doing it on a contingent fee basis then by the hour, goes to his management committee or managing partner, and they say, you know what, we, we just can't take that kind of risk. So litigation finance can be useful there. And in fact, to the chief financial officer of a company, it's an odd thing that when you look at the balance sheet of a company today, almost every asset on it is financeable, right? You can raise money through conventional bond or stock offerings, but you can also finance your office furniture, your computers, your vehicles, your trucks, your real estate, your receivables. Why, when that receivable happens to be uh, a debt owed by another company that is subject to litigation, there's a dispute over it, why can't that be financeable too? So I started to write articles about how there should be a market, there's a need for a market, and then I decided to put my money where my mouth is, and I took an unpaid leave of absence from Georgetown and started a company called Burford Capital. Uh, which in the years since has grown into the largest supplier of financing and risk solutions for companies involved in commercial litigation today. Um, we raised our money in England, and this will help get into the, a little bit of the history. We raised our money in England, publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange AIM market um, from institutional investors, Invesco, Fidelity. But we did it in England because England and English investors were more accustomed to litigation finance at the time than was true in the United States. And that was true because, um, and, and actually it started in Australia even before England, because historically contingent fee arrangements were not permitted. Lawyers could work for conditional fees, which meant you could discount your fees, say bill at 50% of hourly rates, and then if there's success, get an uplift to 150%. You could go as low as 0% and uplift to 200%, but you couldn't go beyond that. You couldn't take a share of the damages. So you can imagine if you're a London city firm that's got a profitable business model based on the hourly fee, why are you going to give up your hourly fees for the prospect of 200%? You'd have to be really confident. The handful of Amlaw 50 firms that do a lot of contingent fee work in this country, maybe more than a handful, but maybe less, um, they, they usually aren't looking for a double when they're going to give up their fees. They'd like at least a triple. They'd like more money. So there wasn't the availability of counsel on a contingent fee, so litigation finance made sense in those countries. Um, but it also made sense in the United States. The value proposition is, even though contingent fees are permitted in the United States, and frankly they are now since permitted in England. And, you know, England has embraced litigation finance and now has broadened and allowed contingent fees. There's uh, Lord Justice Jackson uh, did a study, made recommendations, Parliament ultimately enacted them into law, embracing litigation finance as a promoter of access to justice, and then has since also embraced changes that allow lawyers to work for a contingent fee. So if you're a client, your lawyer is supposed to advise you on the availability of financing as one option, but now you have the choice if you can go to your lawyer for, for a contingent fee arrangement or you can go to a third party that provides finance. But why in the United States, if we've had contingent fee arrangements, do we need this? Well, the reason is we all know the bar in the United States, at least among litigators, really does divide into two categories, right? There are, there are lawyers who do a lot of contingent fee work, but they generally don't handle complex commercial disputes. They do a lot of personal injury work. They will do class action work, mass tort work on the plaintiff side. They're not the, the, the law firms that are used to litigating complex commercial disputes between uh, sophisticated counterparties to a deal. Um, the sorts of lawyers you want for a complex commercial dispute, and that is, and, and I'll talk a little more about it, that's what we're really talking about on this panel. I'll talk in a moment. There are a couple of other things that sometimes get confused with what we're talking about here. But, but the lawyers who, who handle those disputes generally look at work at firms that do very well with an hourly fee model and aren't willing to take that kind of risk. Um, so what litigation finance enables the law firm to do, what Burford enables the law firm to do, is the law firm partner says, I've got this great case with a client that's maybe used the firm before. I can think of an example where uh, a lawyer at, at a major national 
our leafy firm had an email go around to the litigation group saying, hey, we've got a corporate client that's got a piece of litigation. They don't really want to pay by the hour. Can we recommend a firm that would do it on a contingent fee basis? He said, why are we giving this work away? He went and pitched, said, well, you know, I know somebody. I know, you know, I've worked with Burford. I know they could provide financing if you need it. It turned out that actually the client liked him so much, said, why don't we try by the hour for a while? We'll see if we need financing down the road. And to have that in your arsenal to, to be able to take on business is a real plus for a firm. We understand it for clients. It's a way to get the law firm of your choice at the billing arrangement of your choice. Um, so uh, let, let me talk a little bit then about uh, regulation, the, the issues we're probably going to get into now. Regulation, is there any need for regulating this? The answer is no. There is a difference between the sort of litigation finance we're talking about here, where you've got sophisticated commercial counterparties, and there is something you may have read about where, where state legislatures have paid attention to it when you're talking about finance companies providing small advances to personal injury victims while they're waiting for settlements or trial judgments to come in on a non-recourse basis. They're talking about $1,500, maybe $2,000. There, there's been a push to make sure there's transparency and competition so that the, they understand the interest rates they're paying. Here, you're talking about sophisticated counterparties who have their own in-house lawyers. They don't really need uh, that kind of protection. Um, Champerty, there's an historical doctrine you've heard of, but you probably never studied in law school, um, of champerty. Doesn't that prevent people investing in litigation? Well, historically in feudal England, there was a concern that a powerful feudal lord would trump up litigation in order to extend his fiefdom, expand his real estate, and take advantage of the litigation process and the weaker party. In England, they've completely about done an about face, recognizing that litigation finance today is used to level the playing field, not aggravate imbalances, and they've embraced it as promoting access to justice, also recognizing there are other mechanisms we have to protect against meritless suits, like Rule 11. Um, attorney ethics, people ask, is, is there an issue on attorney ethics? It's not that much different from an insurance company footing the bill on the defense side. Um, basically, when Burford does a deal, at least, the, the attorney-client relationship remains the same, the client calls the shots on settlement, on litigation decisions. The attorney owes its duty of loyalty to the, to the client. It, Burford's just a passive provider of finance. Um, and, then, and then finally, work product privilege issues. Does it create a, a issues there? And you can imagine that it would be completely wrong and against our system if the company that decides to self-finance its legal fees through retained earnings doesn't have to turn over to the other side its litigation strategy and confidential material. But the company that decides, you know what, rather than paying hourly fees out of our retained earnings, we're going we're to obtain financing to do it. Why should that mean that if you've shared information with a litigation funder in order to get the financing, you have to turn it over to your adversary? And the doctrine says you don't have to. Work product doctrine says that you can share materials prepared in anticipation of litigation with an ally. And as long as you don't materially increase the chances of it being turned over to the adversary, it's not, the, the protection's not waived. Attorney-client privilege, there's a doctrine, common interest uh, privilege, where as long as you're careful and you enter into a common interest agreement before sharing information, courts in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and Texas, courts that have thought it through have said it's protected. There is a decision out there that was, you know, a few sentences in an omnibus discovery order by a magistrate that didn't think it through, but on the whole, um, it's, it's protected. So my summary, I know I've gone over, is it's a good thing, uh, doesn't need regulation, and under current existing rules, it's something that, that uh, lawyers and clients should consider. Well, thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Okay, yes, okay. Um, I had a nightmare the other day it was one of these pure fantasies. I woke up in 2019, the doorbell had rung, went to the door, there was someone there with papers to serve me with a lawsuit. I said, all right, what is it this time? And um, he said, it's your ex-spouse. Uh, your ex-spouse has learned that um, you really should be paying more than in the last agreement that you uh, reached. Um, uh, your last book did so well. I, I told you this was a fantasy. Um, 
But I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, <clears throat> I spoke with my ex-spouse just last week, and she said that she wanted to move on with her life. She was really tired of fighting with me. Uh, and he said, oh, well, yes, that, that is how she feels. That's why she sold us her rights in the divorce. Um, and he handed me his card. It um, described his firm as a marital rights assertion entity. I, he said, please don't call us by that ugly name, divorce troll. Um, now, as um, you just heard, there were some major, major uh, ethical and indeed uh, criminal uh, barriers in the way of uh, financing lawsuits, however you might want to finance them. And I will quote the speech given this year by uh, Lord Justice Newberger of the British Supreme Court, a strong advocate of litigation finance. Um, the definitions vary, but let me uh, quickly go through them. Champerty is <coughs> a uh, practice in which you uh, procure by direct or indirect financial assistance uh, of another person to institute or carry on or defend civil proceedings without lawful justification in exchange for a share of the proceeds of the action or suit or other contentious proceedings. That's Champerty. Now, Champerty was traditionally described with, uh, in conjunction with two other crimes and torts. All three of these were both crimes and torts uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, maintenance was interesting because maintenance was the same thing except that the person providing the money did not get a share in the outcome but was just doing it either for the hell of it or to harass some opponent or for some other purpose. So it was illegal even if you did not take a share in the outcome. Baratry was yet another step back. Baratry was the uh, moving or stirring up or maintaining of suits, quarrels or parties that were not your own. So once again, uh, this was an offense even if you weren't providing money, um, but you were promoting litigation, gi giving people the idea of, of uh, uh, suing or, uh, as they called it in their somewhat moralistic way, wanton and officious intermeddling, a phrase that often recurred in, when courts would talk about champerty. Now, exceptions grew up from a very early uh, stage, which indicated that the courts realized they couldn't be quite as sweeping as all that. One of the very first exceptions was that your relatives or people who were in some other way uh, connected with a dispute could maintain you, could champer you. I, that was actually a verb. Um, but uh, it was allowed for them to do so if it, they were not complete strangers. Uh, it also <coughs> happened from a very early point that poor people uh, who could not maintain their cause in any other way could get money even from strangers if it were demonstrated that without that they could not have pursued the claim. And finally, you will not be surprised to learn that lawyers got themselves somewhat exempted from some of these rules because uh, they sure wanted to uh, advance litigation and uh, finance it where possible. So that particularly in the development of the contingency fee, we began l letting lawyers do some of the things that others could not do. Notice, however, that one of the restrictions was not that they would only punish you if the suit were frivolous or meritless. Uh, these were very much crimes and torts, even in cases where the underlying lawsuit was entirely meritorious. Now, over the centuries, these have decayed, particularly in the last century. Now, uh, not just in Britain and Australia, which have in some ways led the way, but also in the United States, it is hardly anywhere treated as a crime or a tort. You still see, however, that it is the subject of bar discipline in many places. Uh, in other states, it is unenforceable. A, a Champerty's contract is unenforceable as against public policy. These are important barriers, of course, to uh, lawyers who want to go ahead with litigation finance schemes. <coughs> now, as a libertarian, I'm generally cheering along the removal of old common law crimes. Uh, I certainly have no problem with many of the evolutions by which formerly criminal and tortious things have become uh, neither. Uh, <coughs> we got rid of the usury laws, for example, and that was, uh, economists tell us, a good thing. Otherwise, we could not have the modern credit card industry. Uh, we got rid of criminal conversation, that is, uh, the. Uh, possibility of going to jail for trying to convince someone to co commit adultery. Uh, and there, too, I see the logic. Without adultery, we would not have the modern novel. Um, <laughs> we, <coughs> we used to have criminal libel, and we have gotten rid of criminal libel as a uh, topic of the criminal law. And again, that made possible the political internet. Um, the, uh, so yes, um, 
uh, very often we will want to remove outmoded and oppressive old uh, laws of this sort. But what fascinates me is that each of those areas that I just ticked off was the subject of major, major debate. Oh, people went on and on and on talking about things like adultery and criminal conversation and usury and, and, and criminal libel. And we haven't had our debate about whether or not we should be legalizing champerty maintenance and baritry. So I'd like to spend a few minutes, okay, one minute, so I'm told, um, <laughs> on, on why. The, um, <clears throat> so that we know why this wall might have been erected before we tear it down. Um, one of the basic questions is, do we want all legal rights to be uh, pursued to their absolute maximum? Um, if you believe that litigation is a public good, as is now mostly taught in law schools, you will say, sure. Uh, if you believe that litigation is a necessary evil and quite destructive, you may think twice about that. Um, there are problems with the difference between lawyers who have obligations as officers of the court and are reachable by discipline and litigation funders who by design are not. Uh, there are problems in the prosecution and settlement. Uh, I believe that Burford Capital sincerely does not want to have to interfere with settlement strategies. Uh, on the other hand, we all know that the bank that is so hands off when the loan is making money may uh, take a different attitude when the loan is in trouble and, and it liable not to be uh, paid off. There is the issue of counter interest, and, and I mentioned trolls. Uh, if you want to know where this could all lead, think about patent trolls, because uh, in them you have an organization that has no counter-interest, has no counter-reputation, uh, can't be enjoined itself from manufacturing, and has set itself up just as a litigating entity. Uh, are we content with this new system? So I am not as comforted as many readers will be. I went, went to the Burford Capital website. It has a lot of very good material explaining this, but I am not as reassured by the idea that Rule 11 is a perfect uh, <coughs> backstop to prevent the use of this for bad litigation. I think, last I heard, Congress had gutted Rule 11 at the behest of uh, organized lawyers, and uh, we don't actually have terribly good defenses to frivolous litigation. So will this result in ethical train wrecks or not? We're all going to find out. Thanks. Good afternoon. Let me also add my thanks to the Federalist Society for inviting me to speak. Uh, like Walter, I too had a nightmare the other day. Uh, and the nightmare was that the Cato Institute and the Chamber of Commerce would be in favor of the heavy hand of the state regulating free markets between free peoples. Uh, but my, my nightmare came true. Uh, and so I'm going to use the remaining six minutes and 30 seconds of my remarks to try and persuade my friend Walter and my friend John to come back to the free market laissez-faire bandwagon where they rightfully belong. Uh, litigation finance uh, between commercial enterprises, which is the species of litigation finance that we're discussing this afternoon, uh, adds a lot of value to the constituencies that enter into the arrangements. I want to just echo the remarks that Jonathan made. Um, when GKC gets involved in an opportunity, very typically this is how it goes. I'll get a call not from John yet, but hopefully after this remarks I will, but one of his partners at Skadden Arps will say, Ashley, I need your help. We have a large institutional client. It's a Fortune 500 company. We deal with the majority of their defense side complicated engagements, but in this particular instance, they need to be a plaintiff. They have a good breach of contract claim or someone's infringing their patent and they want to bring suit. And naturally, because we service them most of the time and they're comfortable with us, we've been dealing with them for years, they want us to bring the litigation. There's just a teensy problem. The general counsel is getting a lot of pressure from his fellow C-suite executives to keep the budget in check. And while defense side engagements are wars of necessity, they have to fund those, offensive litigation is a war of choice. And so they don't necessarily have the capacity, even though it's a large company, there's a lot of cash on the balance sheet, they don't have the capacity in the legal department to bring this claim. I've tried to accommodate them. The Alternative Fee Committee has offered a 20% discount off our rack rates for our best clients, but that's not good enough in this case. It's gonna cost five or six million bucks to see the case through to completion, and they need partial or pure contingent economics. Can you help? Can you facilitate this relationship going forward? And of course, that's what we exist to do. We look at the opportunity, and if we like it, we do help. We provide the financing. I'm not sure how it is harmful to society uh, for a large company to get the law firm of their choice uh, to continue to work with the law firm that's been servicing them for years. For the law firm to keep business that would otherwise go down the street to a pure contingent shop 
or potentially for the litigation not to be brought at all, uh, or how society benefits from a good patent not being asserted or for a contract that's been breached not being uh, vindicated in court. You know, to the extent that the civil justice system is designed to deter bad conduct, we want people, uh, especially corporations with large claims that are going to attract attention uh, when they're successful, to bring those cases into court. So that's the relationship that litigation finance facilitates. All of the parties to that contract <coughs> obviously are receiving a benefit, and they're all big boys and girls on all sides of the transaction. Again, this is not a hypothetical. GKC has several Fortune 500 companies that they financed with AMLAW 50 firms. Um, so these are the sorts of relationships that I typically would expect the Chamber and the Cato Institute to be completely in favor of, and 300-year-old doctrines of champerty and maintenance and feudal lords really shouldn't come into the picture. Um, let me talk about some of the traditional criticisms of litigation finance for, for a moment uh, that we haven't heard about yet, um, although John may be at the ready. Uh, one of which is that it just increases the volume of litigation full stop. Um, two responses to that. The first is it's not clear that that is so. Uh, economists would say that the impact is ambiguous. Uh, so the availability of financing that otherwise wouldn't be available can stir up some litigation that wouldn't have been brought otherwise. So that's going to increase the volume of litigation. But as I've already mentioned, there's a deterrent effect. The civil justice system is predicated on the idea that litigation, when meritorious and brought into the courts, deters bad conduct. And so for every patent that's asserted uh, and successfully um, recovered against, or for every contract that's breached and brought into court and vindicated with money damages, that d deters the next person from breaching a contract or infringing a patent. And so the overall impact on litigation uh, is not clear. But even to the extent that empirically we evaluated the question, and by the way, I've seen no empirical studies on the impact of litigation finance in the United States, at least the commercial variety that we're speaking about this afternoon. Uh, even if the volume of litigation does go up, uh, it's not clear to me why meritorious claims being brought into court is a bad thing. Again, this, this goes to the point that Walter was raising. Do you view litigation as a public good or as a sort of nuisance that does great harm to society? Um, I think it depends on the merits of the litigation, and to the extent that the litigation is meritorious, society is not worse off for that litigation being brought to the court system. Uh, so a variant of the criticism just made is, well, you're not just increasing as a funder the volume of litigation, you are increasing the volume of junk, meritless, ineffective, inefficient litigation. Um, and to that I would say, as a funder from a Machiavellian pure business perspective, it's not in my interests to finance lawsuits that are not likely to prevail because my investors only reap a recovery if the lawsuit is successful. That's the nature of the non-recourse financing relationship that litigation funders are entering into. <coughs> and so to the extent that a funder's evaluation of the merits indicates that the lawsuit is junk and is not going to yield a recovery, uh, that lawsuit is not likely to get funded. And to the extent that funders are out there taking flyers on these sorts of lawsuits, they're not going to be funders for very long. And in fact, we've already seen here in the United States a funder that put a significant amount of capital into a dubious case that proved to be unsuccessful and that funder no longer is in business. And so the invisible hand of the marketplace is perfectly well suited to weed out those who are going to finance meritless suits such that in equilibrium, again, economists would tell you, we're going to have funding that's optimal. You're only going to see funding behind lawsuits that make good sense to be brought. And again, I, I can't see the principled objection to that. And so um, I think the best part of these discussions are the Q&A from the audience. So I'm, I'm happy to cede the floor at this point and, and leave it there. Thank you very much. It's an uh, honor and privilege to be with all of you here today. And Needless to say, I have a little bit different uh, perspective than Jonathan and Ashley have voiced on this subject. I have deep concerns about the uh, notion of third-party litigation funding. I think it's important, as, as Jonathan noted at the outset, to understand that there's a lot of different forms of this. And I, I have to concede that some of these are less troubling to me than, than other forms are. But keep in mind that what we're talking about here is investing in litigation. Nobody's used that word. No one stepped forward to say that what we're talking about here are funds investing in litigation, buying a piece of these cases. 
and profiting in the end uh, uh, from, from these cases if, if they are successful. Uh, Ashley is, is correct that one of the major concerns I have about this is that it basically, I think, it, it's, 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 it's hard to believe that this is not going to increase the amount of litigation. And I, I, I don't think that the increase in litigation just for the purpose of doing that really creates any benefit. It has to be lowering the bar on the decision-making process of when a lawsuit is brought. I would start with the proposition that if you talk about the ability to bring lawsuits and the legal system encouraging almost the bringing of lawsuits, the United States is at the top of the heap in that regard. As was noted earlier, we've long permitted contingency fees. But although there are some changes occurring in Europe in that regard at this point, most countries don't permit contingency fees. If you want to sue somebody, you pay for it. Likewise, long ago, we did away with the notion of the loser pays the other side's fees, costs, and expenses. Most other countries have the principle of loser pays. And so there is some hard decision making to be made before you bring a lawsuit. But here we've eliminated those two concepts. And if that has not generated enough litigation, we're going to be adding third party litigation to the mix. I don't want to say I'm a huge fan of the contingency fee system, but one of the merits of it at the moment is that it does create some filter about when a lawsuit is brought. If I want to bring a lawsuit, I have to find, a, and, I, and I want to bring it on a contingency fee basis, I have to find a lawyer who, after evaluating it, decides that it, it has sufficient merit for me to put some sweat equity into it. And that has created some filter on when lawsuits are brought. Under the system that's being proposed with third party litigation finance though, you have this fund and a, and a large number of funds that can basically hedge their bets among a lot of cases and invest in lots of things, lowering that bar over time. It may not have completely happened yet, but over time in the same way that we've seen the plaintiff's bar at some level lower the bar by investing broadly, we're going to see the same thing occur in, in a more dramatic degree as a result of the hedge fund investments. You invest in lots of cases, and if some of those ships come in, you're gonna make a big profit. The other thing that uh, is, is of great concern to me, and, and I, I want to address this pointedly because everyone is talking about this as though is, is an exercise in free enterprise. Folks, litigation is not free enterprise. When you get sued, when you're a defendant, you are trapped. You're not a free business partner in that situation. And in our litigation system, with the discovery process that we have out there at the moment, you have a, 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 a huge threat to your fundamental being as a defendant because of the cost of litigation. I respectfully submit that a major reason why most litigation is settled is not necessarily because of the merits, it's because the cost of dealing with the discovery in the case is so enormous, you don't really have a choice but to do it. And that's the problem with our litigation system and having people come in to invest in those cases. You can bring a case now that may not have much merit, but you know, as the person bringing the case, that you're probably gonna come out even in the case because at some point, if you wanna get out, the defendant will pay you something just to escape the burdens of discovery. And so if you're one of these investors, what you have there is not a free market economy, it's a captive situation. I can bring somebody into court, I can subject them to discovery, I'm probably not gonna lose on that case because I can at least come out even by getting a settlement. And I might be able to get, uh, move that case a lot further and make a substantial profit on it. That's the system we're talking about. 
I don't think anybody is talking here about regulating in this circumstance, in, in the sense of, uh, of saying you can't do it or, or anything along those lines necessarily. I do think that in litigation where you have an investor, somebody who has bought a contingent interest in the outcome of the litigation, everyone ought to know that. So that is one form of, I wouldn't say regulation, but basically leveling the playing field that ought to be out there. If, if there is an individual who's made an investment, that ought to be disclosed up front in the litigation. I think that given the discovery and balance in these cases, we also ought to be looking at the, at the situation that if you have people who have invested in the litigation, whether the normal uh, responder pays principles in discovery ought to apply. If you have a regular free market business transaction, I'm not able to demand that somebody give me something for free. Why should that exist in this litigation circumstance if I've come in as an investor as opposed to somebody who's simply there to uh, seek redress for alleged wrongdoing? And I also think that in this context, if we're talking about investment and we're talking about free economy, in the cases where you have investment, loser pays ought to be there. I mean, that principle perhaps should be broader than that, but at least in that circumstance where you're not talking about somebody invoking the judicial system to seek redress for wrong done for them, but who has simply marched in the court to make a profit those principles of loser pays, as, as, as you would have in the normal free market uh, system, ought to apply there as well. Thank you. Yeah, with, with that, what we'll do now, now, unfortunately, we have this podium be, between us, so maybe you can't see each other, but, I, but I, what I would encourage you to do is this is now a chance for the sure. panel to speak among themselves to react to uh, so, one another's comments. So. so I'd like to start out with something where John and I may actually agree, which would be great, and then a place where we strongly disagree, which is I have an article coming out in the Vanderbilt Law Review next month about the advantages of combining a loser pay system with the availability of financing and insurance for both sides. The idea, the way it works in England is, you know, the, the whole idea behind a loser pay system behind, behind uh, fee shifting is if we want accuracy, we want to deter people from taking bad positions, whether defendants from defending strong claims and losing or plaintiffs from bringing uh, frivolous claims and losing. And so having, having fee shifting makes sense in that context. The problem with fee shifting is if we think there are already potential imbalances in, built into the system that the more powerful versus the less powerful. Um, the less powerful, once the stakes become higher, because you're going to have to bear not only your own fees, but the other side's fees, that's a big risk. But if you could go to a third party and get insurance against the other side's fees and financing, uh, I, I'm, I'm open to that and I'll explore that and I'll, I'll actually send you a draft. Um, the place where I disagree um, is, is this notion that with contingent fee lawyers, you get screening. But with litigation funding providers, you don't get screening. I would say it is, that's completely backward. Because what's a contingent fee lawyer giving up opportunity cost? If they don't have that many other cases going, the cost might not be that large. Moreover, they're the ones who can control how much time they spend on a case, right? You take a whole bunch of cases, you, the ones that are going really well, you put your resources into them and you work on them. The ones that don't look so good, you scale it back. And there are studies showing that, you know, in cases that pit contingent fee lawyers against hourly fee, fee lawyers, miraculously, it takes contingent fee lawyers like half as much time as hourly fee lawyers to do the same task. Because if they realize something isn't going well, they're not going to want to put the effort into it. When a litigation funder puts backs the case, it's cash. It's not opportunity cost, it's cash. And you don't control the litigation process. So if I'm gonna hire a firm like Skadden or, or, as, as a client, and I'm gonna get financing from some third party, the lawyer at Skadden is gonna run that case. There may be a budget, just as if the general counsel of the company were paying his own bills, he's gonna try to keep Skadden on a budget. You know, there's the good luck, it's difficult to keep lawyers on a budget, but you try. But you're not going to be saying, oh, I don't want you to take that deposition. 
you know, let's go ahead and put out the discovery request, make them sift through all those documents, inflict expense on them, but we're not going to go through what comes out just because we're looking to inflict expense. If you're hiring these top-notch firms and you're looking to Ashley or to me for financing, Ashley and I are not going to finance it unless we're pretty certain this is a highly meritorious case because you're putting up cash. Um, and <coughs> so uh, I think... I think that if anything, if you know, the, you could say the English system before they allowed contingent fees might have, you know, allowing third-party financing but not lawyer financing. You could understand why they might go that way. Um, but but I think both should be allowed. I believe in the free market both ways. Um, yeah. For, first, I will say that I um, do have a lot of agreement with the first point Jonathan made about. Um, how useful it is to look at the institutions in England, both uh, legal expense insurance for plaintiffs and af after the event insurance. Uh, uh, these uh, have proven to be practically extremely helpful institutions to have um, uh, in conjunction with loser pays. Uh, on the disagreements, inevitably, um, we have heard about the good practices of uh, the two firms represented here today, and I have no reason to doubt that uh, they indeed are looking for meritorious cases through good screening. Um, uh, we heard from Jonathan that uh, the cases he takes he believes help level the playing field. Presumably, they are taking the side that is less well-funded uh, and is in a dispute with a larger company. Nothing, however, prevents the next litigation finance company from being organized along somewhat different lines. And again, the rationales of patent assertion entities come to mind. You hear from patent assertion entities, oh, well, we're needed to uh, level the playing field against Microsoft and Google and Apple. Um, uh, you know, why would we ever launch one of these cases if we weren't evaluating their merit? And then you find the actual practices of patent assertion entities include uh, filing hundreds or thousands of strike suits against little cafes and uh, bed and breakfasts and things because uh, they're, they're, they do the rational calculation that they'll get a few thousand dollars li licensing, quote unquote, fees. Uh, and we know that there's a problem there because when those same patents have gone to litigation, they've been found invalid. So um, <clears throat> in his very first remarks, uh, Professor Malo mentioned that there was this divergence between uh, the economic value of a case and its actual merit. And uh, we have to take into account that the people organizing tomorrow's litigation finance companies uh, will completely exploit that difference. Let me jump in with a couple of points. First, John began by saying that no one is willing to own up to the fact that they're investing in litigation. I will own up to that fact, and proudly so. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the notion that uh, litigation is not free enterprise. Uh, litigation itself might not be free enterprise, but the business of litigation very much is free enterprise. Nobody tells Skadden Arps or Kirkland and Ellis what to charge. They charge the market rate for their services. Clients choose which law firms to go to based in part on price. Uh, there's price competition. E-discovery vendors and everybody else in the space is charging whatever the market will bear. Supply intersects demand. It's a very free enterprise system. And capital uh, provided to players who have to pay for those free market prices uh, is a perfectly appropriate free enterprise function. Uh, let me touch briefly on the point made, which is that junk lawsuits are going to get funded. And there was a concept brought up, I think, by both Walter and John, that because people can diversify and run this sort of like a fund, they can afford to take more flyers. Well, hedging and diversification are not magic words that suddenly lead to increased risk taking. I used to work at a hedge fund before I was doing this, and there are lots of hedge funds and mutual funds that have lots of capital and they can be diversified and hedged and most of them don't invest in penny stocks and biotech companies pre-FDA approval, which would be the high flyer meritless uh, stocks to invest in, but if they hit, they yield a really great return. Um, but let's put that to one side for a moment. Suppose a large company came to Skadden Arps or another Amlaw 50 firm and said, I want you to evaluate this patent opportunity. We think it's pretty good. Firm comes back and says, you know what? There's some prior art. It's pretty risky for you. We actually think you're worse than a coin flip. There's only a 30% chance you're going to win. But if you do win, you're going to get $100 million in damages, and we, Skadden Arps, are going to charge you $5 million to bring this case. The company might sit down with its executives and say, 
this is a good lawsuit to bring. We know that it's risky. We know we might not win, but we're here to maximize shareholder value. This is worth 30 million in expectation. It's gonna cost us 5 million to bring. We wanna bring it with Skadden. They're a terrific law firm. They're our typical law firm to bring these suits. We're gonna go forward. I don't think Skadden's gonna turn down that business. Um, it's a perfectly appropriate exercise for a corporate client to take some risk. Why does it matter whether the source of financing for that lawsuit is the shareholders of the company, the public shareholders of the company, the bondholders of the company, or GKC or Burford? By the way, every lawsuit that we have financed, we believe, has a much better than 50% chance of prevailing. But to the extent that there are some clients that have a higher risk appetite, uh, I don't see why those suits are suddenly defined if they were brought by the exact same firm, the exact same client, with the exact same merits, but the source of financing is different. Why, in the one situation, they're junk, but in the other situation, they're a perfectly acceptable um, risk calculation by the parties in charge of bringing that lawsuit. So, those are my remarks. <clears throat> Just a couple of quick points. Ashley, on the point I was making about litigation uh, and, and being part of the free enterprise system, granted the legal profession is that. What I'm talking about, though, is the whole business model that uh, funders are operating under are the fact that we're going to invest in this because of aspects of the litigation system. We're going to make this investment because uh, there are a lot of things that are very favorable to the investor. I can get all sorts of things. I can get discovery without having to pay for it. You wouldn't have that in a normal business transaction. And I can put all sorts of pressure on the other side through the litigation process that wouldn't be there normally. And I, th I think the, the problem is that we have a system that has been constructed with the idea of letting the individual have access to the system to obtain redress for grievances. And I think we as a legal community have concluded that is a good thing. But a lot of those principles don't work when what you're talking about are people getting into litigation as a business for profit, investing in the litigation. And I think that's the part that would need to be, needs to be re-examined to the extent that investment is involved in the business. One of the things I want to go back to that Walter said before too is I worry a little bit in this discussion that frankly Jonathan and Ashley, you know, you're top of the line companies in terms of the way you've approached this. And I think I've told you Jonathan, you know, some of the things that, that your organization has talked about, that you're not going to invest in class actions and so on, which I believe is a position you've taken. I think are honorable positions going into this. You've been sensitive to the policy issues. But that isn't happening across the board. I, and I, I will just relate one experience recently of, of a uh, company that was trying to figure out why all of a sudden are we getting all of these lawsuits with respect to a particular product. And all you had to do was go to the internet to figure out exactly what had happened and it's all driven by funding. And you've got financial institutions out there, not yours, but that are there saying that they will make non-recourse loans available to attorneys who wish to bring a certain type of lawsuit. Interestingly, they say, we can figure out a way that you can charge the interest on that lo those loans to your clients. The interest rates on the loans, from what I could figure out, appeared to be, in those cases, around 42% per annum. And so you basically have these, uh, those, those sets of financial institutions encouraging lawyers to take on these particular kinds of cases. Then you click around a little bit further and you see ads directed to the consumers who bought this particular product. And it says, hey, if you have filed a claim in a lawsuit like this, we'll give you a consumer loan on this case in 48 hours. Just give us the information on your lawsuit. And so what you have here on the internet is set to diff two different sets of financial institutions <coughs> that are on the one hand promoting the bringing of these sorts of claims by providing this sort of financing to the lawyers to do it and saying to the to potential claimants, hey, file this lawsuit, you get a couple thousand dollars in 48 hours. 
It's a non-recourse loan, again, 40% interest, so if you win, you will probably won't get anything in the end. It'll all go to the funder. But that's what we're setting up here, and you can't tell me that that is not increasing litigation. I mean, in this instance, we've seen it. I'd love to see the website. <laughs> I'll send them to you. Yes, send it to me. I'd love to see that. Um, okay. 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 Should we turn the time? Uh, do we have, have questions from the audience? <laughs> and I believe we have a microphone here in the middle, so please uh, identify yourself and uh, remember these are questions. <laughs> Got it. John Vecchioni. I'm a uh, practitioner out of Fairfax. I spent uh, most of my career in defense work. I'm now in plaintiff's work. And I was wondering first, why would you hire Skadden to defend against a meritless claim? I would think you'd hire Skadden because you're in trouble. <laughs> um, and my second question to follow up on that is, is that would this type of financing um, that we're talking about be channeled to increase profit, will we see more claims for, um, I, I, don't, I don't agree that, uh, about the meritless point, but there is this point. To, in order to increase the profit and have the return, um, would you see more claims for treble damages for the type of statutes that create treble damages and create punitive damages? In other words, would the type of the financing change the type of claims that often have a higher bar but um, give greater return? So I, I guess it's a good question. My, my sense is um, on, the, on the question of the ratio of potential damages to the cost of the litigation, there's no doubt that whether it's a contingent fee lawyer or a provider of finance or a company that's self-funding, they're going to take into account that ratio and decide is the benefit, if the case is successful, large enough to cover the costs and leave something over either for the client alone or if there's for the client, the funder, and the law firm. Because often, even the top firms will take some risk and, and, um, and there'll have to be an uplift for them as well. In terms of the question of will you then seek out the kinds of cases that will have treble damages as opposed to just big contract damages, part of the problem is, I mean, I, f I know there's a lot to talk about patents. Burford has really shied away from patents, doesn't do the troll stuff. Uh, and it, it's partly just uh, taking Ashley's uh, economic perspective on, on, you know, is it a good investment. My feeling is a lot of those suits, it's so hard to tell at the outset whether you're going to win. It may look like a great suit, you know, in theory because the damages are big. But when there's a commercial dispute, a contract breach, you can know the story, you can interview the witnesses and look at the documents and say at the beginning, you know, th this is they breach the contract, it's clear, and it's gonna cost me $6 million to get there, and the range of damages is 40 to 60 million, depending how you do it, and you can figure it out. With a patent dispute, it can look like the big company stole your technology, but it, it depends not just on how they got it, but did they draft the claims broadly enough, so broadly that they're, they're invalid for obviousness, so narrowly that there's non-infringement. It's just too remote, and this I, I did meant to address, the problem with uh, we're going to go for the big hit, with the big damages, expecting we're going to lose a bunch, is we all know, putting aside the litigation finance business, though it relates to it, but we all know the ratio of fees to damages at stake in the litigation system is just too high. When you add together both sides' expenses and you look at how much money changes hands in a settlement, lawyers are eating up a big chunk of the value. That's great for the lawyers in the room or billing by the hour. I don't mean to, to knock it, but as a society, that is, I mean, I'm sure it's something, Walter, you've thought about a lot. And your point about is pursuit of the merits necessarily a social good? I can see that making litigation more efficient, that's a topic for another day. But what that means is the idea that you can lose a bunch of $6 million suits but you're going to hit one big. My God, if you've lost a few $6 million suits, uh, I think, as, as Ashley mentioned, firms go out of business when they lose enough small suits. I think, I think people are not in the business to take those kinds of bets. They want to know that, and, and it's true, even if things go badly, it may be that people will settle. But generally, to, if you've spent a lot of money, particularly if you're not a contingent fee lawyer, just 
devoting opportunity cost. You're a funder who's shelled out money for an Amlaw 100 firm to go through discovery, and then you realize it's not that good a case. You're probably going to take a big hit, even if it does settle. You're not going to get back your investment. So you, it's hard to make the long bets. Um, on this whole question of um, uh, which lawyers they're going to uh, hire, I, I would predict an evolution. You know, we heard that many of the early cases were scattered, um, you know, recognized the, uh, the case uh, was meritorious and went to the funder, or the client recognized the case uh, was meritorious and went to both Scadden and the funder. Uh, as we see funders move into um, uh, cheaper mass cases that are all along a particular pattern, they're not going to want to use Scadden. Um, they are, I would predict, going to behave like insurance companies that have to do uh, routine, smaller value litigation and squeeze the lawyers for all they're worth, and um, the uh, scadden will be left far behind for that kind of case if, if it ever was considered. And you're going to have the funders, um, I guess, in the opposite seat from the insurance companies uh, taking most of the proceeds and using um, uh, ill-paid lawyers. For, for those mass repetitive claims at least. So Bernstein Litowitz and Coughlin Stoya have portfolios of securities litigation and the Lanier law firm has a portfolio of personal injury litigation. And I can call my broker and invest in TiVo and in their portfolio of patent litigation. Why are all the incentives of existing perfectly legitimate uh, litigation portfolio risk spreading. Why are the incentives to engage in contingent fee litigation different for them than for the litigation financiers that are the subject of criticism? I, this is what I don't understand in terms of the aspect of criticism of litigation finance. Yeah, and I, I, I think that that, that is a concern that I have, is that if you look at how the plaintiff's bar has spread over time and has learned how to leverage their, their portfolios, it has, that has largely been responsible for the increases in litigation, I think, that we've seen in, in recent years. They, and it's limited, though, by the amount that the individuals in those firms, because most of those plaintiff's firms remain fairly small, how much they can manage. But if you have a new business model that comes in that is a fund model, it seems to me that that philosophy that those plaintiff's firms have used will be magnified even more and is going to uh, result you know, in, by definition, in more litigation being filed to feed the beast of each of those organizations to try to generate the profits that are needed. But why is it the incentive different to bring meritless litigation? See, I, I don't think we're talking about meritless. I think what you're talking about is lowering the bar. The cases maybe aren't meritless. They're going to have to get past a Rule 12 motion uh, at, 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 at some point. A lot, of, a lot of cases brought by Lanier and all the firms you mentioned don't, but that's what they're, go that's what they're going to have to do. But I think that you're just going to, the, the, the real problem is if you get past a Rule 12 motion, you've won. Because with, with the cost of discovery in, in these cases, at that point, you are going to get compensated. But we all know that a lot of the cases where you get past a Rule 12 motion, it's only because you've done a very good job of pleading it. It doesn't mean that, the, that you're going to win on the merits at any point in that case. I, I just want to jump in and make sure we're talking about the same thing. So Burford and GKC and the sorts of funders that I think this panel is oriented around are only investing in commercial litigation. So well, there, there's a difference between that and consumer mass actions, uh, which is, to John's point, if you get past a Rule 12 motion and a low stakes litigation, you very well might recover, and this is a problem with patent trolling as well, because we all know that the cost of discovery or the cost of briefing a motion for summary judgment can be more than what the plaintiff is willing to settle for, and so defendants will often pay that toll, pay that ransom to make the case go away. The average investment that GKC makes is $5 million, and we're expecting the 
plaintiff, the actual client, to get at least 50% of the recovery because we don't want to distort their incentives to take a rational settlement. That lawsuit is not settling automatically just because it gets past a Rule 12 motion. Um, the costs of litigation there are not the principal driver of settlement discussions. It's the actual merits of the case and, and the ultimate damages. So there's a yeah. distinction between low value cases where you're lowering the bar to get more shakedown suits uh, and higher ticket commercial cases where there's tens of millions of dollars on the line. This is where we have the problem, though, that I think Walzer was pointing out earlier about talking about specific organizations here. Y y if we're going to open the door to a system the same way at some point we decided to open the door to contingency fee litigation, you're going to get whatever comes as a result of that. And some of it you may look at and say, well, that was probably good for the system. In other cases, you're going to say it isn't. But I think that before we throw the door open to this notion of investing in litigation, you know, private firms investing in litigation, taking the place of the person seeking redress in the case in search of profit in those cases, you need to look at everything that's going to happen because if you don't deal with it and don't decide how you're going, what rules you're going to have in that circumstance, yes, you know, we may look at your portfolio and say that's, that's wonderful, but there may be 10 or 15 other funders in the business that make those other cases their target. And so I think that, that that's the real concern I have is you, you've got so much happening very quickly in terms of different sorts of funding coming forward that we as a legal community are not looking at that we need to make some calls. Maybe there's a way to say, you know, this type of funding is perfectly okay and, and this is raising all sorts of issues, but we're not really focusing on what should or should not uh, be permitted or how the rules need to be adapted to deal with these sorts of funding. Well, there are those some existing laws that I think do address, at least in most jurisdictions, the, some of the concerns you'd have. So the, the jurisdictions that would say there's no champerty problem for the things that, that Ashley or I would do, and there's no ethics problem for the lawyer representing the client in that circumstance, because we structure our deals where you have a real client that's initiating the litigation and looking to the third party for passive finance. Uh, I think it is possible that if you have a circumstance like yours, where it's not just someone who's you know, a bank making loans to law firms, it's somebody that's going out and, and, and buying individual claims to, to st and, or, or is making the loans to the lawyers and instructing the lawyers on how to pitch the cases and how to do it. I think it's possible lawyers in that circumstance may be breaching their ethical duties if they are taking instruction from the third party financer and not the client without a knowing waiver where there might have to, you know, there might not be a knowing waiver available for an unsophisticated counterparty there. And it's possible that, that it would be against public policy for you to take over the entirety of the claim in a tort suit. You know, personal injury suits are sometimes different. Champerty does sometimes still exist for personal injury suits. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there may be hope that, in fact, the system can deal with your problem under existing doctrine. Um, do we have statistics on how much of the, the uh, industry as a whole, how much of its money goes into commercial disputes as compared to, say, consumer litigation or personal injury? And then uh, a sa I realize your firms uh, deal with uh, commercial litigation, but I'm wondering industry-wide. And then a second question, I'm also wondering who typically uh, funds this stuff? Who's the end user funder? Is it typically the type of big investors that would put money into a venture capital fund or is it more Ted going to his broker and saying, you know, give me, uh, buy me a hundred shares of whatever? So, so there is something, there's sort of two different worlds here as you've gotten the sense of. And the two, the, the answer is in one of the worlds, in our world, you can look around and pretty well t see just by reading the Wall Street Journal um, how many funders there are out there and how much money they have and what they invest in. And it's not a lot of money compared to if you look at the billables of the AMLO 100. It's a narrow subset of cases where it's just about money because you, you know, a funder's not going to fund something that's seeking injunctive relief and there's not a way out. Um, where you've got a commercial client, you've got the law firm, it's a small portion, but you can see that. 
you know, it may not, there's a question that John did raise transparency in individual cases. And I think if there weren't discovery nonsense into, in terms of defendants wanting to see the exchange of materials between the funder and the terms and the litigation strategy, I think then probably funders would be fine saying we're going to disclose it just the way insurance companies disclose it. If there isn't that protection, I don't know. But the problem is there is the rest of what we would call litigation finance that's not at issue here. The general way it works is that contingent fee lawyers will band together and fund each other. And I, 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 my hunch would be some of the, the funding you're talking about is that <coughs> contingent fee lawyers going beyond the usual of we've got a syndicate of a panel of lawyers in a class action on the plaintiff side, some are putting in labor, some are putting in money, and they allocate the lodestar based on that. I think that goes on and it's very hard to see that how much money it is and who's doing it is hard because it's it would actually be more transparent if it were done commercially from the outside rather than by the lawyers themselves. In terms of the small, you know, the website, I'd love to see what that is. I wonder if that's a contingent fee lawyer who made a bunch of money and says, oh, I can go beyond just funding my buddies, I can go out there and post a website and fund others. There, there's probably not as much information because they're not as open. But my feeling is the more we promote um, the type of commercial litigation finance we're talking about, um, the more likely it is you're going to have openness and transparency as to how much capital and whose capital, as opposed to if you're keeping it to lawyers, it's all, uh, it's not so clear what the funding sources are. I mean, the transparency part of this, I think, is, is a real problem, and I think, I think there's agreement on that. Um, probably needs to be an amendment to Rule 26 of the federal rules that says that's one of the things you disclose up front is anybody who's got a contingent interest in the outcome of the litigation. Indeed, I think given the nature of some of the funders, the judges are probably going to start needing to know that because you could well be sitting on a case not knowing that something you've invested in has invested in a case before you. Um, but. You know, this, the, the information of this is so random, it pops out usually because a problem comes up. Um, you know, J Jonathan, your organization's investment in the Ecuadorian uh, litigation, which was, you know, not a commercial dispute, um, you know, came, came forward because of issues that, that arose there. And, and, and uh, so I, I think this transparency issue to get an understanding what funding is going on, who's doing it, where it's going is, is pretty important. Would you agree if we're amending Rule 26 for disclosure, would you also be willing to amend 26B3, the work product and uh, doctrines to make clear that while they're revealing it, that communications between a funder and a, a funder's lawyer are, are off limits? I mean, I think they are anyway, but it would be nice to provide that, yeah, to I make think clear that when you're providing the judge the information on conflicts of interest, you're not handing over a sideshow on discovery that's well, going to create Yeah, we, we have a long experience with the other side. In, insur insurance uh, status needs to be disclosed, yes. but communications with the insurer, which reveal litigation strategy, do not have to be, and it sounds as if it's the other side of that same It, it seems point. like that would work fine. It's a little different with insurance because usually the insurer gets to approve the settlement is the source of the settlement funds, whereas the funder doesn't necessarily have that. I think if a funder had control over settlement, the comp, you know, having it be just like insurance would make a lot of sense. Yeah, there's a big difference of the insurers paying the money, so that's a little. That's right. It's a little different in terms of the approval process. So, so my, if you could also address my second question, which is, who are the end user funders? Are they big investors? who are savvy or are they small investors where at some point the SEC is going to get involved? Oh, so at least with respect to Burford, it's largely institutional investors, I mentioned, Invesco, Fidelity, large institutions. Some hedge funds have, have bought stock. It's publicly traded. You can see who owns it. Um, I, I think there is some retail trade uh, in the stock, but it's very small as to how much there is in the way of retail investment. And GKC is structured very much like a private equity fund, and all of our investors are qualified uh, to be part of that sort of investing instrument. So there's no retail. It's all high net worth and institutional investors. One enduring consequence of the financial crisis is that clients of all sizes are demanding that law firms like John's and mine at Deborah Boys and Plimpton uh, get away from the billable hour and adopt alternative, fund, uh, alternative fee arrangements. Uh, which 
can often include contingent fees or other kind of arrangements that essentially seem to put us in competition to a degree that we weren't before with funders. Whereas before, funders would come and they'd pay our freight and there we go. Now the clients are coming to us first in a way uh, Professor Malo was talking about more often. And I'm just wondering whether you see this trend potentially offending, the, uh, potentially uh, impacting the funding industry and, and what impact it's going to have on your opportunity to invest in the future. So I found it to be a positive development. It is true. I've been surprised noticing that firms, that there are firms increasingly taking more contingent fee work. Part of it is, and, and they tend to be firms we work with a lot, sort of AMLAW 50 firms that will do partial or some full contingent fee cases. And there's always a, ba a, a debate among the partners, right? There's the partner who says, you know, a friend, yes. who, was, a friend who was at Cravath <laughs> who's like, you know, down defending a product's liability suit in Alabama and the, the plaintiff's lawyer shows up in a Ford Escort and he says, you know, he knows this guy's got planes and like he's very successful. He says, I thought you were doing better than that. And he said, oh, this is my jury car. Come over this weekend, I'll show you the bank, right? <laughs> so there, there, are, there are lawyers at big firms who say, hey, why can't we make money like that guy? And, and they'd like to take risk. And there are other lawyers that say, you know what? I've got like three kids in private school and college tuitions and a mortgage and I'm very happy and this is a, you know, our, our profit margins are on an hourly fee business are quite good. We don't need to, to strike it rich. Let's just bill by the hour. And what we find is the firms that have that tension, what, what they can do by coming to one of our firms is they can decide how much or little risk to take, right? They don't have to do a pure contingent fee or bill 100% hourly. They could discount to 80% to 70% to 50%. They could have just cost covered. They can structure it however they want and the client gets the fee arrangement they want and the, the law firm gets the risk arrangement they want. So I, uh, and, and I love a case, right? In terms of the screening mechanism, when Debevoy says, I've taken the case on a contingent fee or we'll take half our fees, then I, my ears prick up and I say, I'm interested. This is probably a good case. Not only do they want it, but they're willing to put their money behind it. Yeah, I, I would echo that and just say that oftentimes when someone is willing to, a law firm is willing to take a case on pure contingency, there's still a role for the funder to pay the cash costs, which can be quite considerable. Uh, and so you're willing to put the opportunity cost of your time up as risk capital, but you don't necessarily want to reach into the partnership's pocket to pay the discovery costs and the expert witnesses, and a funder can play a role there too. Um, I, I would point out that there's at least one important dimension in which uh, ethically uh, it's actually probably uh, better uh, to have the litigation funder than to have the lawyer absorbing the same risk. It, traditionally, the critique of the contingency fee, which is very much a critique of defense contingency fees as well as plaintiffs, is that uh, lawyers, um, much as they might try to be honest, they will be influenced by the fact that a fortune for them personally is at stake if they get victory rather than loss in a case, and they will not behave as carefully about the marshalling of evidence and about uh, the, the ethical treatment of the various other decisions that come up um, in some ways, I would be happier insulating the lawyer by keeping them on uh, hourly fee and shifting all of the um, uh, gambling risk to a genuinely silent partner riding in the back seat. Next question. Hi, I'm Michael Lovins. I litigate in Austin, Texas. And I think even those, the, the panelists who are not in favor of these new financing strategies would agree that, especially for small businesses, when they have uh, been wronged by some other player, the legal fees can be crushing and can prevent them pr from bringing very meritorious claims because they just can't afford to do it. They don't have the cash flow regardless. And uh, a lot of attorneys, myself included, are very hesitant to take commercial cases on contingency. So what other, how do we solve this access to justice problem for someone who they certainly don't meet the, the criteria for underprivileged, but neither can they afford to pay a, a, a lawyer by the hour to bring their case for them. I don't think I've said today that that shouldn't be permitted uh, to do that. I just think that if you have a funder in the picture, it may need, there, there may need to be some uh, aspects of the system that have changed because you no longer have uh, this small business, this small business isn't there anymore. You've got big funds suing somebody else, and so some of the 
modifications that we've made to our legal system to deal with the access issue changes. And, and if you've got somebody who's invested in the lawsuit, then that may be a different picture. I'm sorry, I just have to differ with you a little bit. It's not the big fund bringing the lawsuit, it's the fund financing the lawsuit. The no, lawsuit the, is still brought you by bought the corporation. It. You've bought I, it. You're I, the real party in interest at that point. That, so, you know, let, let's, true. you said before you were going to acknowledge that you were investing in a lawsuit. I'm a and passive investor. I'm a passive investor. Well, I don't take control of the lawsuit, well, and neither does Burford. You know, so, I, I, I know that's take, what take everybody, me, I know that's what everybody says, I'm telling you it's true. But I got to tell you, if I'm investing in you, I'm <laughs> assuming that it's not a, a, a purely passive investment. All of my investors see the same documents that say I'm not taking over the lawsuit. So I'm, I'm just telling you flat out that what you've said is incorrect. I'm not saying that you don't think it, but I promise you it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think it, so. <laughs> see, I told you there would be some spirit to it. <laughs> Thank you for throwing that in. Agreeing with John that there is a Rule 26 problem and, and that parties can um, generate results from meritless litigation by Rule 26 abuse, and that's been acknowledged for decades. There's a 1989 Easterbrook Law Review article on the subject. Why is that not a Rule 26 problem rather than a litigation financing problem? What about litigation financing creates an additional aspect to the fundamental problem that, that's there in the rules already? I'm sorry, why does litigation? Well, uh, actually, maybe I can address, you know, and then tee it up for John, because I, I don't disagree with you. The way I came to this, I gave you my little two-second biography on it, but the way I came to this is I was one of those civil procedure scholars who wrote about the problems of Rule 26 and sounded a lot probably like John when you combine the absence of fee shifting, contingent fees, excessive discovery, we spend more in this country on litigation than we would without that combination. How can we reform it? And I spent years writing about, well, you could tweak with this. What about more, you know, more aggressive summary judgment? What about fee shifting based on the merits at some point in? And I began to realize those were problems were, they're, they're really tough problems to solve. And I thought there is one smaller problem that you don't need procedural reform to solve, which is that where imbalances in resources or, or risk preferences are skewing settlements, right? If it turns out you've got two equally situated parties, whether they get financing or not is not going to affect the outcome. It's just going to make it, that's more of a corporate finance matter. The CFO cares about it. The general counsel cares for his, his you know, budget, but it's not, the litigation system doesn't care whether a Fortune 50 company is getting financing or paying itself. For the small guy who's up against the big guy that was talked about in the prior question, then the system does care. And the system says, we, we got to, there's two problems here, right? The bigger problem is our system is too expensive, it takes too long, it's too unpredictable. That's true whether it's financed or not. And I understand that, that John and Walter thinks financing may aggravate that. But I view that as one problem, and I think it's the same problem whether the case is financed by a third party or by the company or by the lawyer. The other problem is what happens where the expense delay risk manifests itself in a way that's not equal for the two parties and leads to a settlement that doesn't reflect what would happen at trial. It's not just two equal parties saying, well, I think it's worth 50, but I'd spend 10 to get there, so you know, I'll take this, and you think it's worth 40, and you'd spend 10 to get there, and there's a settlement range. It's a, uh, I can't afford to go to trial, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna take a, something much less than I'm entitled to. Or in the case of the defendant who would like insurance, I'm still trying to crack to get enough capital to do it. I don't know anyone other than Berkshire who has enough to do it. But to take the defense side risk, there is a way I've, uh, we've started to do it. But to be able to take the defense side risk of the defendant to say, I'm not settling. This is, a, this is not a good suit. And even though I've got a business reason to settle, you know, I'm going to lay off the risk to someone else and go forward. Like, that is the narrow problem I think this industry is dealing with. And the bigger problem you're talking about, about litigation is too expensive and time consuming, burdensome, unpredictable. We got to work on that, but I don't think that this either aggravates or assuages that problem necessarily. Maybe assuages a little. <coughs> I always think that the question of who is the big guy and who is the little guy in litigation is uh, often ripe for deconstruction. You know, you have a lawsuit against some uh, uh, local, you know, uh, craft brewery uh, over a uh, 
<coughs> dram shop claim and the lawyer who actually is assembling it and financing it uh, you know, is a much richer person than the bar owner, and yet we apply uh, presumptions and legal doctrines that it is a uh, little guy suing a big guy. I remain to be convinced, after this is developed in another 10 years, that litigation finance will be any more common for claims of small entities against large entities than it will be for claims of some large entities against small entities. Uh, certainly the large entities being sophisticated uh, will know of their financing options very early and will often find occasion, I suspect, to hire financiers. Any further questions, comments? Thank you very much. Thank you, members of the panel.